الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الحمد وله الملك يحيي ويميت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة وأول العلم قائما بالقص لا إله إلا هو العزيز الحكيم الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا وأشهد أن قاعدنا وعزيز نفوسنا وقرة أعيننا محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أرسله الله للناس نذيرا وبشيرا ورحمة للعالمين محمد رسول الله والذين معه أشداء على الكفار رحماء بينهم من يطع الله ورسوله وأول الأمر من المؤمنين فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأول الأمر من المؤمنين فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم من عصيانه ومخالفة أمره يقول الله عز وجل وهو أصدق القائلين في كتابه الكريم وما لكم لا تقاتلون في سبيل الله والمستضعفين من الرجال والنساء والولدان الذين يقولون ربنا أخرجنا من هذه القرية الظالم أهلها وجعل لنا من لدنك وليا وجعل لنا من لدنك نصيرا الذين آمنوا يقاتلون في سبيل الله والذين كفروا يقاتلون في سبيل الطاغوت فقاتلوا أولياء الشيطان إن كيد الشيطان كان ضعيفا Brothers and sisters committed Muslims.
on Jumu'ah every week we are required to say something about the taqwa of Allah and the reflection of a public taqwa is a social ambiance that rejects injustice and prefers justice on previous occasions we talked about the meaning of justice the importance of justice in society the need for representative leaders to behave according to a standard of justice and in the short time that we have today because of the weather we will briefly discuss the nature of justice and war some may think that the reality of war and the presence of justice cannot be mentioned in the same sentence and certainly when we talk in the context of these court massages all over the country and all over the world certainly the two subjects are not broached together in the same conversation in the world that we live in and perhaps for the bulk of history when people go to war especially those who happen to be armed they leave all moral standards at home all principles of proper human deportment are put in the door and so when armed individuals soldiers combatants go to war they visit all manner of atrocity upon their victims torture humiliation dislocation degradation rape murder theft any kind of atrocity that you could imagine is visited upon the victims in the theater of war and if war itself were not subject to moral rectification then this deen of Allah Islam would be just another secular religion and because war is a permanent feature of human society and because we expect that in the coming future it will remain a permanent feature a, per a perennial element of human discourse that it ought to be subject to a standard of morals and so because Islam is a totality it does not exclude war from moral discipline <laughs> all of us know that war is a nasty business an odious enterprise people go to war and people die people launch missiles and entire communities perish 
those who survive the casualties are themselves bereaved. There is sadness, there is humility. There is loss. There are tears. There is blood. There is injury. And people are maimed for life. Emotionally and physically. And so war is a dirty business. That is not something new. That is something that all of us recognize. But nonetheless, war is necessary. It is necessary for the oppressed. And it is a means for the oppressor to consolidate his power. But insofar as the oppressed are concerned, they need to engage in a war at times to reverse a position of injustice, to reverse a position of degradation, of humiliation. And so the short-term negative of a war is meant to offset the long-term negative of oppression. The long-term negative of injustice. The short-term military casualties that happen in a war are meant to offset the long-term social economic casualties in a society. And so the shuhada that the Muslims give in a war are meant to preserve the lives of ordinary citizens in a just society. In the world that we live in, there is a war machine that is out there. There is a killing machine that is out there that thinks that it can use war as a mechanism and as a means to pursue national interests and to codify and to ensure class stratification. They do not reject war because of the pain that it brings. In fact, what they do is that they endorse war as a means to get what they want. And when they talk about war, especially in the world that we live in today, they talk about entire societies engaged in war. They talk about the, total, uh, the concept of total war, meaning that entire societies, their intellectual potential, their human potential, their aggregate ability to do research, their wealth, in terms of their human wealth and in terms of their material wealth, all of that is engaged in the declaration of war and in the prosecution of war. And in that kind of war today, in that total war scenario, we are also talking about total and complete destruction. We are not talking about the sin of murder and killing. We are talking about engaging all other types of sin within the domain of total war. And so we are talking about stealing. We are talking about rape. We are talking about ransacking. We are talking about plunder and any other sin, any other moral vice that you can think of is involved today in the domain of total war. And so this begs the question that if we Muslims live in this same world and we have a moral restraint on the declaration and the prosecution of war 
that if we Muslims live in this same world, when war falls in the domain of moral rectification, why do Muslims go to war? What is the purpose of Muslims going to war? And when they go to mo war, are there standards that they need to observe? And because of the limitation of time, we will only briefly discuss the purpose of Muslims going to war. And when we talk about purpose, and we talk about people dying, and we talk about people being dislocated, we must refer to Allah's guidance in His book of guidance. الذين آمنوا يقاتلون في سبيل الله والذين كفروا يقاتلون في سبيل الطاغوت فقاتلوا أولياء الشيطان إن كيد الشيطان كان ضعيفا This is the 76th ayah in Surah An-Nisa Allah تعالى says As for those who make a secure commitment to Allah, they fight in the path of Allah. And as for those who deny Allah's presence in the human affair, they fight in the way and for the purpose of the concentrated powers of evil, of taghut. And so fight the subsidiaries of shaitan. Indeed, the plan of shaitan is weak. And so the first thing to notice in this ayah is that two realities exist in the world. The first is a reality that confirms Allah. And the second is a counter-reality that denies Allah's power, presence in the human affair. The second thing to notice in these ayat is that what drives this denial into human legislation, into human deportment, into human relationships, that drives this kufr in to human society is the concentrated power of evil, a taghut. Without taghut, you would not be able to drive kufr into human relationships. And so there is an essential relationship between kufr on the one hand and taghut on the other hand. Between the ideological orientation of kufr and the practical mechanisms of Taghut. Another thing that ought to be obvious from Allah's words is that not just anyone ought to be able to decide why entire societies go to war. Especially the nexus of special interests that constitute Taghut. They ought not to have a say in why people go to war or why they abstain from war. War is a matter of life and death. When people go to war, they die. Entire societies suffer the death of their loved ones. And so war is a matter of life and death. And so it ought to be up to he who gives life and pronounces death. It ought to be up to him to decide what is legitimate war and what is illegitimate war. It ought not to be up to somebody's national interest to decide what is legitimate and what is illegitimate. And yet that is what is happening in the world today. The Qur'an is an open book. 
It is open for non-Muslims and it is open for Muslims. The Muslims don't own the Qur'an. They don't restrict access to the Qur'an. They don't prevent people from looking into the Qur'an. And because it is an open book, any non-Muslim who has an idea that we are terrorists, that we, know that we need no excuse to go to war, because this is an open book, we invite them to look inside of this book. For it is this guidance that delineates when Muslims can go to war, and when they cannot go to war, and according to what rules they ought to go to war with. The divine course stands out because of its ethical principles and because of its moral standards. Muslims go to war for the principles of justice. Let us say this emphatically. Muslims do not go to war for a national interest. They do not go to war to occupy somebody else's territory. They do not go to war for labor and for markets. They do not go to war to enslave another population. They don't go to war to improve somebody's class status. They don't go to war for race or for color or to emphasize somebody else's geographic origin. They go to war to establish mechanisms for the adjudication and the establishment of justice. When we talk about the taqwa of Allah on earth, we are talking about societies that are trained, that are coached to prefer justice to injustice. But those who thrive in an ambiance of injustice, those who thrive on an imbalance between the rich and the poor, those who thrive on financial cartels, those who thrive on military occupation, are they going to stand by and let Muslims reorient society so that it is acceptable to Allah? Are they going to stand by and let Muslims do their work? Are they going to stand by to allow Muslims to revitalize the principles of justice in the hearts of man? And the answer to that is no. They are going to fight the Muslims tooth and nail when the Muslims assume this social and political and economic responsibility. Justice is the centerpiece of all legality. Human beings depend on justice. Human beings thrive on justice. Human beings reach the most noble of their character in an ambiance of justice. And so when Muslims go to war, they go to war to establish social justice. Let no one be confused about this platitude and about the mechanism behind this platitude. Muslims fight for justice, ideologically and militarily. But at the same time, even though there is a divine reality of those who strive for justice, there is a counter reality of those who strive for injustice. It is this interplay between those who strive for justice and those who strive for injustice. It is this interplay that ultimately leads to a better situation. Because in the nature of things, truth is always better than falsehood. In the nature of creation, that's just how things are. 
Nobody is going to tell you that falsehood is better than truth. And because truth is better than falsehood, this interplay between those who strive for justice and those who strive for justice, this interplay between the two opposite poles is ultimately going to lead to a better situation. Because it is in the nature of things that truth is better than falsehood. However, there are a lot of Muslims who live in a dream world. They think that this concentration of power that exists in the world today, with all of its mechanisms, all of its institutions, all of its ideological foundations, they think that this can be just reversed with words. That we can just talk to these guys and we can convince them that there is a better way to achieve a just society. But this is not what Allah Ta'ala is saying. Allah Ta'ala is saying that if you want justice in your world, if you want justice in your society, if you want justice in your community, that you have to struggle for it. And oftentimes this struggle is just not an internal struggle, it is a struggle of arms against arms. It is a struggle of strategies on the battlefield against other strategies on the battlefield. It is a struggle of jihad and qital. Truth and justice and fairness triumph with the Islamic concept of jihad and qital. Let no one convince you in this world if you're reading the Quran and you're following the example of Allah's Messenger that the vehicle that carries the da'wah is jihad. Jihad, da'wah is not, milit- is not missionary activity. The invitation to Islam is ideological and military at the same time. It's ideological to people of justice to thinkers of justice, to pursuers of justice. But it is military to the Taghut in the world who prevent the thinkers of justice from having justice. The poor never got justice by begging the rich for justice. The have-nots never got justice by begging the haves for justice. If justice is an inalienable right for all human beings, then you don't beg somebody else to give you justice. If justice belongs to you, if it is a characteristic of you, and it is there for the taking, then you take it. You don't go running after human beings, begging them for freedom, liberty, and justice. This is something that belongs to you, and if it belongs to you, if it is your property, if it is your right, then you go out and you take it, by force of arms if necessary. Jihad is just not some hypothesis. That Muslims get a feel that Muslims get a feel of by going out and experimenting with it. Jihad is an integral part of Islamic personal development, of Islamic social commitment. When the call for jihad goes up, then no Muslim has the license to refuse this call. If there is no injustice in your world, perhaps you could refuse the call of jihad. But never has there been a situation in the world, in the past or in the present, and it appears in the near future, where the ta'ud has not existed in your world. And to reverse this ta'ud, you have to engage in a program of jihad and qital, according to Allah's standards, 
according to Allah's command and counsel and with the purpose of instituting and implementing justice in the world. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه يغفر لكم فاسترشدوه يرشد الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله There is a relationship between justice and the prosecution of war. There is a relationship between just standards of war and just outcomes of war. And if we take a look at the situation in Syria, it could be said to us Muslims, that on both sides of this war there are Muslims who are engaged there are Muslims who are fighting Muslims but these ayat make it clear الذين آمنوا يقاتلون في سبيل الله والذين كفروا يقاتلون في سبيل الطاغوت and as for those who deny Allah they fight for the consolidation of concentrated power. And anybody looking at this situation, the purpose and the goal of the two sides ought to be very clear. There are those who are fighting for the Tawhut in the world to further consolidate their power. And if we look at the facts on the ground, there are those in this conflict who take innocent people to the tops of buildings, who line them up and then simply push them off the top of buildings. There are people, armed individuals, soldiers, who go next to a masjid and who line up innocent non-combatants with their faces towards the wall of the masjid. And then they begin picking them off with their rifles and their handguns. These people say, La ilaha illallah. The murderers say, La ilaha illallah. And the murdered say, La ilaha illallah. But just because somebody is saying, La ilaha illallah, does he fit within the ambiance of this Quran? Alladina amanu yukhatiluna fi sabil Allah. Where was it in the example of Allah's Messenger? where he took people to the tops of buildings, lined them up and began to push them off the tops of buildings. There is an example that we can point to. Where is it in this example that in the busiest time of the day, in the morning, when parents are taking their children to school, when merchants are setting up their wares in the street, that a bomb blows up at the busiest time. Where is it in the example of Allah's Messenger where He prosecuted a war in this manner? And when the rescue teams begin to show up, and when disheartened families come to see if their loved ones were killed, in this bomb attack, another bomb goes off. Where is it in the Islamic prosecution of war where those who said La ilaha illallah pulled stunts and tactics like this? 
One, one side fights for Tawood. And the other side fights for Allah. And by reading these ayat, if the one side is not distinct from that other side, then you are reading these ayat in a mental coma. These ayat were meant to inspire a transformational change on the ground. Not just a transformational change in the amount of dua that you read in the masjid. These are real life events that are happening in your real world. There are real people in your world who are claiming to be Muslims, who are prosecuting a war by killing people who are unarmed. By setting up rape motels for their, for their victims, women. This is happening in your real world. And if you are not, be able, if you are not able to bring the moral ethic of prosecuting a war to a real situation in the world that you live in, then you cannot qualify to call yourself a mu'min or a Muslim. اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك قريب سميع مجيب دعوات اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاب اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك قريب سميع مجيب دعوات اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان الذي قصد إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر في اسمه وسعى في قرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خذي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيفاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة